Well, this looks interesting. <laughs> you got six 12 metal plates. Can you guess what this is? Is still squeaking. <sighs> so refreshing. What? Still not sure. All right, you got some rubber silicon. Puts in the ejected molder machine, presses it, blows it up. <laughs> you got a little spaghetti hanging out, and you got these things. Uh, what? It I still don't know what it is. So you got these uh, uh, rubber things coming off. Oh, no. I have no idea what these are. Oh, here it is. We found them, boys. We found them. They're silicone brushes for uh, baby bottles and stuff like that. So now you know. This graphics card gets faster the more you game on it. Nobody was... What? It gets faster, turn it on, and the more you stress you put it under, the faster it gets. Are you going to sit there and it gets colder? What affects the speed of your PC is every single little transistor. It has a switching frequency. It has a rate that it can switch between a on bit or one bit or a zero bit. So every time that it switches, heat is generated. And as transistors get hotter, there is a slight performance decrease due to the heat. And then when it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, it actually slightly slows down. Doesn't make sense. It's going to get faster the more that you actually use it. But let's see what else he's going to claim in this video. I was expecting XFX to drop what is probably one of the most interesting GPUs I've ever seen. This Phoenix Nirvana GPU has a couple really neat tricks up its shroud. Firstly, it has modular fans, meaning that you can swap the fans out easily since they're magnetically attached. But the second thing... I actually like that. <laughs> modular fans, just switch them out. As long as uh, they don't fail on you. But uh, I have the same thing in my little fish tank, and they actually work pretty well. Until a snail gets in them. ...is that it's the first publicly announced GPU to use Honeywell's PTM 7950 phase change thermal pads instead of regular thermal paste. And that's exciting for a bunch of reasons. A, they actually perform better than most thermal paste. B, they get better at cooling the longer you run them for. So... Mmm. That's not what that graph shows. It it shows a steady state of performance over time. Ah, actually, wait. Uh, regular thermal paste is in green. The other one's in red. Okay, so so it performs worse, and over time, it slowly slowly matches the performance with the the other thermal paste. Ah, uh, so what you're showing is it gets lower performance. But over time, it matches the performance of any other thermal paste. Just use regular thermal paste. And maybe it's a better if you get a bigger graph and you look at the end, it might match closer to what the liquid metal. But ultimately, it's going to transfer your heat from the CPU to your cooler. And then your cooler needs to take it out. So eventually, it'll get to a point well, your thermal pad has a zero net effect, meaning it's completely reliant on your system to remove the heat. And better temps and power draw as the gaming session goes on. And C, they get better at cooling the longer you run them for. That is, their thermal efficiency improves the... It's a thermal conductivity, my bro. <laughs> Not thermal efficiency. That, that's heat engine. I'll let it slide. Can't count the number of times that I've misspoken. More cycles they go through with heating and cooling. All of this is thanks to the industrial phase changing of the pad that... Well, he, he did kind of get it right at the beginning. Well, let me rephrase it. <laughs> the thermal conductivity of the transfer of heat from the CPU to the heat sink increases as temperature goes up. Nailed it, I think. Still doesn't perform as good as regular heat sink, though. <laughs> It might be just on par. All right, what do we got here? A little motor project. 
So it looks like you got a little ratio between the two. One to three, one to four, and it uh, converts. I don't think that's what it shows, but it uh, converts. Betcha this guy got some a lot of efficiency built in. Probably what? 70, 80% efficient? More like 30? Maybe I need to test this. This is actually how all electricity is formed, but it not solar energy. Solar energy is radiant energy. Instead of uh, converting it from electricity to mechanical to electricity, we uh, go from mechanical where heat turns a turbine, turns it into electricity. We take it, and if we're using a motor, it converts it uh, back to mechanical. Maybe I need to set up experiment. Got a little little big Bertha right here. Let's do it later. Oh no! It's going fast. It's all right. I have to turn the sound off on this one as well. All right, we got some zeners. Future Bronky here. These aren't zeners. These are regular diodes. Shame on me. All right, you hook them up in series, and then you uh, add it to ground, and then let's add a little LED. All right, so you turn on your phone, and when it's right next to it, it, it picks it up. Little device. All right. Add a little context <laughs> each each time. You go across that zener. It's not a zener. You can elevate your your voltage by a little bit. You stack those up. There's some internal capacitance with those components. As all electrical components, and uh, it just scales that voltage up enough to where it can actually light that LED. So, uh, what use is this little item? Like it is, not much. But there are better versions of this. That you can purchase to pick up uh, voltage. So it's not going to pick up just your cell phone. It will pick up anything that has current going through it. <laughs> anything with a magnetic field with a potential across it will pick it up. What would happen? Hmm. One charger what will water? happen? Let me try it. Here's an old 5 volt USB charger. And this one has a USB-C charger. Let's plug it in. Well, nothing yep. happens because they both stay at five volts. So these are circuits in parallel or voltage supply in parallel. Let's draw this real quick. All right. Uh, oh, come on. Where are you? Mm. All right. Let's go with battery. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's the same thing. No, it's not. God damn. All right. There you go. Uh, uh, let's connect these. Up like so. Here's what we did <laughs> right there with the uh, when we connected those in series. Let's call this uh, USB one, uh, USB two. Boom. We're gonna call these guys boom. Whatever, it's not the right nomenclature. I don't care. <laughs> Who knew you were such a rebel? All right, this is uh, uh bong, boom and bomb. <laughs> So you you connecting these guys like this? What do they do? Nothing. But you still have five volts on there. So let's add a uh, resistor. All right. So voltages in parallel. What these guys do is uh, they keep the voltage the same, but you double the current. And when you do that, you get double the current. So one device you get one point five. You add two devices, you get three. Three amps of current you can get out of there. Like and subscribe. Back to the video. Well, wires, the ones on the outside of the band would need to stretch while the ones on the inside need to compress. But by twisting the wires, they are on the inside and the outside. So the forces cancel out. Ah. This is used everywhere, especially in uh, electrical engineering. So you have a solid wire, uh, like so. And you bend it once, it makes it hard to bend it back. Plus, your joints get weakened. The advantage of this kind of cable, it's 
not that pliable. You bend it in one place and you use it in that one spot forever. You'll see videos with your house wired with stuff like this. It's cheaper and uh, it's able to carry the current better in a, a smaller frame. Now you have multi stranded wire. What? Let me uh, show you this. All right. Right here. Mm. Mm. This better not be making me turn red. All right. There you go, slowly but surely. How about this? I just cut it. Ah. Uh, so this guy is so flexible. So flexible because of these little strains. It makes this uh, useful for constantly rewiring, rerouting, because uh, you can do a lot with it. This is rigid. You bend this enough. Like so, it'll break. More PC stuff. Let's see what's going on here. Intel's finally addressed why their CPUs are dying, and it's kind of alarming. In case you're not up to speed, like Intel's own chips, here's the DLDR. The high-end 13th and 14th gen CPUs are getting unstable because they're being put... It's too hard. Last week, Asus released a BIOS update that should fix it. And after that, MSI and Gigabyte dropped their own Intel baseline profiles, that is. And Intel released a preliminary mm -hmm. statement saying that, yep, it's motherboard makers that are doing this. They're overclocking the CPUs from the jump, so Intel will be encouraging them to release the baseline profiles. But Intel will also have a more complete statement in May. The biggest problem with this is that this isn't new. Mambos have been default overclocking for years. You're deep. Hey! Put your attitude. Go to the living room and play. You're making a mess. Ah, uh, this is the issue with overclocking. And I see all these comments that say, oh, you need to overclock. Overclock. There's nothing wrong with overclocking to your uh, mobile or the uh, RAM specs that they're calling out to. This is why Intel and AMD released their XMP and Expo specs for their board. Or for their chips. Every single IC chip has a slight variation in them. They don't function accordingly across different uh, different builds. And so they categorize those builds based upon how the chip's performance. So you'll have a Intel i9 and an Intel i7. They're from the same die, but because... The manufacturing is slightly different between those two because there's little particles that can get in there that can cause issue. It makes a performance difference.